this year I'm rolling out Family Genius Zone. And so what that is, is, you know, we got Mama's Genius Zone, Teen Genius Zone, Tween Genius Zone, Tween is like the preteen, so to speak. And it's getting to that Genius Zone concept to whereby personal success begins at home. You see, if you think about it with the with the chaos that we got going on right now, you know, we take things for granted, but where does uh, the first classroom that we ever encountered? Um, home. No. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Sandy Hart, and I want to thank you for joining me on this amazing liminal odyssey at a time. And in this rapidly evolving world that we have the privilege and the responsibility to navigate with the gifts that we alone have been entrusted with. We don't know where we're going, but we know we are on our way. And each one of us hold a critical important role in showing up with our passions, our talents, and our soul's purpose. And our, my guests help us excavate, discover, and disclose just that. I cannot wait for you to meet my very special guest today. Um, a Quite a treat, in fact, Johnny Tran. But first, I have a little bit more housekeeping to do. And I, I have to state the obvious. Um, and Johnny, I don't think you know this yet, but this is one of the first calls with the new name, Alchemizing Liminal Spaces, formerly Kitchen Table Conversations. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. And I had to kind of keep this contained because of, and yeah. you'll find out why, but the spirit of the kitchen table conversation is so appropriate today because the title of Johnny's book is From My Mama's Kitchen. All right. And we're yep, going to be that's talking, you know, can't wait to get into this. And, uh, and the, this, the rest of the title is Food for, Food for the Soul Recipes for Living. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah? Yes, okay, good. sure is. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. So before I introduce <clears throat> you, Johnny, um, I, I begin each one of these calls by explaining the symbol that you see on the promotional material for this call. Each of these conversations carry with it a different energy, as does the liminal odyssey chapters. They each carry a different vibration, a different energy, a different spirit. So it, it, while it wasn't intentional to come up with a, with a different symbol for every chapter, um, that discovery happened um, after it was actually at the interior designers. I pulled it back, said, we have to do this, add a different symbol to represent the energy um, and change the artwork inside of the book at that point. Um, I, I think these calls also carry that same energy. And, um, and so I chose for this call, a, a symbol that was so appropriate for you, Johnny, and for the, our conversation. It's the Celtic grandmother's knot. This is symbolizes loyalty, love, faith, and motherly love. It's what the symbol means. And so you, everyone, will see why this is a perfect symbol uh, representing this call. So now, Johnny Tran, um, whose life journey and spiritual awakening has prepared him uh, to be a compelling experiential keynote speaker with an insightful transformative message on how to use the power of resilience to design our life, to live and perform in our genius zone in today's world. We had this thriving conversation before we even started <laughs> recording today. I had to ask him to stop because I needed you to hear this. So we're going to get back to that. Um, and, you know, just imagine this, jo Johnny left his homeland and his mother and his father and his family at the age of 18 to come to college here in the United States. And, and by 33 was successfully leading a multi-generational workforce as COO. Um, since 2009, Johnny has been entertaining and enriching humanity with um, animating Practical, timeless principles he learned from his nine moms. Wow, that who's <laughs> who, who sound very blessed. He's also a Reiki master teacher and a healer. Um, and his energizing storytelling uh, presentations connect with audiences. For, and um, uh, and he really does resonate with you. It, you will resonate with his real life stories of circumstances failures, successful rebounds. I can totally relate to that. 
and he's a ballroom dancer. I mean, come on. So welcome, <laughs> Johnny. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it, Sandy. It's been a pleasure uh, knowing you uh, over the months and so forth. And I'm really excited to be here uh, to share my thoughts and to be with your audience. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you are <laughs> so welcome. Um, Johnny, so I'm all, and I like to start these, th these calls the yeah. same way. I am really interested in threshold moments. It's the title of the book, mm -hmm. Liminal Odyssey. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in that liminal space, that moment that you began this journey. What was that moment like? Were, were things changed for you where you knew this was your, your path, that this was where you were heading with your life's work? Interestingly enough, even though the journey started years ago, but I think it finally got focused within the last three years because I've always been someone who is so creative and I'm always involved with so many different projects. Uh, my life has been that way. And I always tell people in my keynote speeches, I say, you know, you got what you want to do. Your parents got the whole agenda for what you want to do. And then, of course, God comes up, you know, with his program. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, you have to juggle everything. Having said that, the beauty of it is as I started talking about the power of unconditional love, that personal success begins at home. And these are the things that I was brought up with. And when I say brought up with is almost unintentionally in a way, because I was adopted at birth in Malaysia when I first uh, uh, came to this world by my Malaysian mom. At 18, I came to the United States to go to college. A year later, my father passed away, and that changed the trajectory of my life. You're talking about pivotal moments. It's like, what the? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, my God. And things happen to whereby it changes the trajectory of my life that I did not set foot again in Malaysia for 15 years. So that's during this journey is where I met eight other wonderful women that became my surrogate mom at different times in my life. They were my teachers, my coaches, my counselors. So all this whole process is like every turn is a new beginning. Interestingly enough, when you think about it, okay? So every turn is a liminal moment. To or not to. To or not to. And But I went ahead and opened those doors and walked through and there's no right or wrong. It's just the experiencing moment. And hold and behold, during that process, was able to be successful in business and uh, working for a corporation and everything else, and then left to start my own business. And then the downfall, simply because of the tragedy of September 11, you know, you can prepare for everything, but you can't prepare for a terrorist attack. <laughs> That's life. Again, so those are liminal moments. It's like, ah. Uh, <laughs> and you start all over again. And then when I sat down and started to think about how did I get there, that's when I realized uh, it's my nine moms. They were my teachers, my coaches, and my counselors. As a matter of fact, that's another liminal moment of writing the book because this is a guy thing, y'all. Ladies, you don't think this way, but we guys do. Hmm, my mom is getting old in Malaysia. I love all her recipes. She may not be able to come visit me much longer. Let me start saving the food recipes <laughs> that I like. And so I started to sit down and start putting together food recipes. And then I call my various moms and I say, hey, I like your this that you did, this beautiful dish, wonderful dish. I want to save that as well. And so, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. We'll give you the recipes. Well, guess what? Seven years went by. I couldn't get it off the ground until my 90-year-old Italian foster mom at the time. She always calls me every New Year's. And finally, she called me up that particular year and said, hey, after wishing you Happy New Year, I just want to follow up and say, when are you going to finish this book? I hope you finish it before I die. I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and then I sat down that April and started writing. And then, whole and behold, what came to mind, came forward in all those beautiful words that I started writing down 
it's not about food. It's about the power of unconditional love that they share. And I finished it in nine months. And the beauty of it is that looking back, had I stuck with the food recipe, remember the guy thing, <laughs> three of my moms were not a minute into the book because I'm collecting food recipes that I want to keep. Wow. <laughs> you got to be political now. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, it was so funny. It was so funny. And so when I finished it, it's like, wow, I felt so good. And then, of course, I was involved with so many other things. And I went around and started speaking about the book. And the beauty of it, what happened, Sandy, is that I knew m women were like it, right? Oh, wow, you have got a guy here championing moms. Another liminal moment was that I have men buying the books and were thanking me. I appreciate you writing the book. In my life, I have four moms. Three moms. There were a couple of book signings that I did, one in Texas and one in New York, where the wife reminded them they forgot one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was very, very interesting. So I was just like, okay, yeah, happy go lucky. All right, I'll do this. And then what happened was slowly but surely, as I realized that everything that I've done, the one common denominator is the fact that I'm a natural leader, I'm a natural motivator inspire and so that sort of narrowed down to whereby the keynote speaking the workshops the all those wonderful uh, personal coaching came in executive as well as life and career coaching came into mind and it was a natural for me and then when i look back we talk about liminal moments you know those snippets in life that's what i i've always done since i was in high school that sort of back you know, back uh, stage director kind of thing, always there, never take center stage, never grab the limelight, but you're always there when it needs to get done, I'm there. And so it finally narrowed down and I feel like I'm being guided to say in the last three years or so, you who focus on From My Mama's Kitchen educational platform. And that's what I'm doing right now to advise to, I guess in the long uh, way of answering your question, that liminal moment just finally dawned on me, this is the natural me. I'm really good at this. I have uh, knowledge and wisdom that I can share to help people to live and perform in their genius zone. Yeah, wow. And, and boy, you sure do. And you know, this is um, first, yes, it definitely has, re you definitely have recipes and even room for journaling, which is so lovely. Uh, yet, it's more of the recipes for living yes. than anything. Yes. I mean, the recipes right. are nice. Um, yes. And who doesn't like a good recipe that came through such a beautiful, you know, way into your life? Um, you also have, yeah, speaking of some of those life skills and some of those mm -hmm. values that you mentioned in your book and that you, you coach perhaps on, you have um, these little tidbits they're they're food for thought little inspirations yes and the first one that just struck me was although we live in an informational technology age we often find ourselves in failure to communicate situations now this hit me really hard because mm -hmm. um because listening the sacred art of listening is such an important value to me i have an mm -hmm. entire chapter on it um, <laughs> and so how do you we don't listen and and you're so skilled at listening if you have nine moms that means you're listening, you're listening. <laughs> and wait let me just back it up here in, in, in defense of women i i i have a I have boxes of my mother's recipes <laughs> you know? and I, and, and aunts and, you know, and even my mom's neighbors who became mm. our aunts. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. So collecting recipes is such a beautiful way of, of maintaining the spirit of that person mm -hmm. forever carrying on their name and their, that legacy of that nourishment that they brought you into your life. Okay. Right. I, I wanted to say that. Thank, <laughs> thank you for doing that. And thank you for, this inspiration. I do want to get back to how you met yeah. these moms and more about that. But right now, let's talk about listening. How how can we better listen? The number one recipe for living, I always tell people, is listen 
to learn rather than listening in anticipation to reply. We all have a tendency to listen in anticipation to reply. When you do that, you're already, okay, how, 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 you know, how, how am I going to react to? But if you listen to learn, it's amazing. And what drives listening to learn? Curiosity. Because we all have different things that we have experienced in life. So there's no right or wrong, but it's you want to know. I remember someone when I was working in the very beginning of my life and work and so forth. Uh, and, and this is, you know, interestingly enough, the older generation, they're very good at So young man, what's your story? I'm sure you've heard of that lingo before. What's your story? Believe me, they will sit down there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. Oh yeah. <laughs> Why? Because they are fine, they're trying to find something to whereby they can connect with you. Because talk is just shallow. Listening to learn is really trying to know how we can have this dance of life together. And the most interesting thing about it, Sandy, you've been there, I've been there, or we've seen people, okay. When people get mad, it's because no one's listening to them. And the number one solution to be an effective listener is listen someone into existence. Yes. I'd love to plug in here right now this beautiful quote by Douglas Steers. Mm -hmm. To listen another soul into a condition of discovery and disclosure may almost be the greatest service one human being can perform for another. That's correct. That's correct. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's amazing because the think about it, even when we are talking to someone, whether we know that person or not, when they gave us, for lack of a better term, the old cliche of Andy Warhol, your 15 minutes, it's like, huh. And then you're wide open. It's ready to go the other way around. Mm -hmm. I was at a meeting one time and somebody was saying, you know, Oh man, some of these people just talk and this. And I said, no, if he needs an hour, I'll let him to do his thing. All I need is 15 minutes. But the difference is this. Since the fact that I listen him into existence, all of a sudden he's like wide open. Oh, and the gift you're really giving him that into that existence. I have been listened mm -hmm. into a condition of discovery and disclosure before where mm -hmm. I have said things that completely surprised me. I un I reveal things about my own truth that I mm -hmm. was cognitively or consciously, I should say, right. aware of. It's really so powerful. And it really is the greatest gift. And it's something we can all do. In my research, I discovered that only 17% of our day is spent in active li or like true reverent listening. Right. I call it reverent right. listening. My friend Patricia Farrow actually, I believe, coined that term, reverent listening. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's truly listening for understanding. It's listening to learn. I love how you put that to learn because you're opening yourself up to not know the answers and truly you're being with the other person. And mm -hmm. I've caught myself countless times thinking how I'm going to keep up this, this pleasant banter because I'm going to have mm -hmm. to say the next thing. And no. I, I don't prepare a lot for these calls because I just <laughs> want to listen to you and see where Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And a lot of time in listening, what happens is that we subconsciously, and it's natural, we all that, you know, that subconscious bias and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So we have perimeters that we talk about. But to give you a simple example, I'm holding up this pen right here. Now, on your side, and that's why I said, you know, listen to learn. On your sign, you don't see this actual hook right here to go on the pocket. So, you know, it, it's, you describe the pen, I'm describing the pen, and you're looking at me, you know, my God, he must be an idiot. <laughs> but because you don't see this. But when I turn around, I'm like, well, who is an idiot? But if you want to listen to learn, then it changes the dynamics. Because I can only, you can only see so much. I see the other side. And on the other hand, is. Don't forget, I can only see so much. I didn't know that there's no hook on that side. Right. Now it builds trust. Yeah, yeah. You see? That's and true. just a simple example is that, and that's what it's all about, is because 
is like giving the other person the opportunity to explain. You don't have to agree. Remember, like I say, I don't see anything over there. <laughs> you know, uh -huh, yeah, really, uh, really. Uh, that's okay. But the very least, you know what? We agree 90%. It is a pen. <laughs> with a cam. I think but that the, that's so important. You know, this conversation is, I don't think we can talk enough about listening, yeah, yeah. the importance of yeah. listening to another, as Go well on. as to ourself, right? Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. listen to yourself? Um, and do and um, I, do you have any wisdom you'd like to share about you know trust? It's interesting. Gets into trust too. The, the uh, it's trusting yourself. Listening. One of the topics that I talk about is listening and talking our way to success. Mm -hmm. Because believe it or not, we talk to ourselves more than anybody else talked to us. So the question is, how are we talking to ourselves? So if we start talking about self-doubts, then that's what happened. And that comes back to full fold in terms of that genius zone concept, living and performing in our genius zone. And what the genius zone is all about is doing, using that concept of curiosity to turn chaos into peace. Because that's when you, peace, when you have that peace in your mind, that produces a creative mindset. Because it's not about me anymore. Everything that we do in life, every decision we make, whether it's personal or business, because of my background. And this is what I was trying to say as I go through life and I realize when I look back, like, wow, the principles are the same, whether you're on this side or this side. I mean, there's certain things, you know, they're a little bit different, right? But in the end, the, that's the, the, there's a governing body here. And so there are two equal but separate forces that govern all of our decision, our thought process. Love or fear? Love is about the other person. Fear is all about us. Now, interestingly enough, you know, when we look through the lens of love on somebody, that's where we're talking about, you know, self-sacrifice and that we're willing to jump in front of a traffic to save somebody, not even thinking that, you know, that we're going to get run over ourselves. And then the funny thing about fear, this is the thing. You got somebody you love is about to jump off, like especially a child. Hey, mom, let me show you. I can jump off the second floor and, you know, ta-da. But you say, are you kidding me? Are you... You're not afraid for them. You're afraid for yourself. I'm going to lose a son. You see? Think about it, okay? So the funny side about it is that, can you hold on for one second? Let me pull out the master bedroom <laughs> mattress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving an example here. You know, it... it, it by doing that, on the other hand, see how you feel on the inside. All of a sudden, that's fear, but then that's love. You want to do that? Let me support you. I mean, it's, I'm just being facetious here, but in the sense that it changes your dynamics. So what happens is when you listen and talk your way to success, it's about where am I doing here? Am I self-sabotaging myself or am I talking the right things? And that's where I talk about, you know, in the genius of concept, those kind of things, the self, uh, the six cornerstones of self-mastery, self-care, basically, to handle that. Where we, it, one of my, uh, it's very interesting, one of my moms always told me, as easy as you can talk yourself out of something, <laughs> you can talk yourself into something. That's a big difference. All right. I love the question, Why? <laughs> Why? Mm -hmm. It's such a good That's question. curiosity. You see? It's That's curiosity. curiosity. And then yes. I say, why? Keep asking why until, you know, until it's bite size. Until there you, you go. really kind of get yeah. your arms around what the real fear is. Because fear is slippery, right? It, mm -hmm. it wants to cloak mm -hmm. itself in all kinds of of Precisely. of. of a betrayal or victim any form of victim yeah situationally yeah. yeah yeah lack of, of mm. abundance you know scarcity right. so when you just keep asking yourself that question why and bring it down to something you can chew on uh then it's easy to spit right out <laughs> very it's amazing and sandy the interesting part about it you know i always tell people whether leadership within oneself or leadership as a team leadership is about leading people, which is in this case you, but manage situation. No one wants to be managed. You see, a good leader leads people 
manage situation. And those are the ones that are natural. You can tell how many times, and this is funny because I remember the other day something happened and I was in a conversation and I remember even at a very young age of being a leader, believe it or not, I mean, there's all this chaos going on, right? And one of the things that my guys, my uh, management people and so on, always say, you know, how come you're so calm? You're not, you know, excited, but they don't know that inside, like, oh my God, you know, but I don't show it <laughs> because somebody's got to, you know, get their head straight, right? So when you get your head straight, whether it's for yourself or others, all of a sudden right now, you're managing situation, you lead people. Yes. You have that clarity because like you're saying, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see that happening. So you're using curiosity to sort of unfold, unfold, unfold until you see something that we all can act on That's and beautiful. you are in control. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. I use the analogy <clears throat> of archetypes to, identify, to mm -hmm. stop and think, well, really, who's in control here? Because that brings us to self-awareness. Right. Am I in, am I, am I, Am I in a mother energy? Am I in a responsible party energy right now mm -hmm. to have to hold the field to mm -hmm. be? Today is, happens to be, and I talk about being spontaneous and being a listener. Mm -hmm. Today happens to be Tavu Shavat. In the Jewish tradition, it's the holiday of the mm -hmm. trees. This is today. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and there was a beautiful prayer that went out by the, a very famous rabbi, um, I write about her in the book, Dr. Terza Firestone, who, who's a mm -hmm. master in intergenerational trauma work as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she says, today be like the tree. Just observe. Hold yeah. the space. Yeah. Yeah. Sink your yeah. roots down. Observe yeah. without needing to respond. To me, that's my yeah. energy. So that's right. I would like to use that bridge <laughs> to <laughs> ask you. Because I want to get back to something yeah, yeah, relating yeah. to what we were saying, but I really, I really want to ask you about your moms. I sure. want to know. Well, first of all, I think it's just such a beautiful imagery of you and, and symbolism of you leaving your mom with this beautiful relationship. I mean, you have such a sweet admiration for your mother. It's it's so heartwarming. Uh, it's really breathtaking. And how you tell one story. Mm -hmm. in your book um in the very beginning of how you know you can have a little a, a heat maybe even a heated argument and right. your mom will go to walk out of the room but first she'll touch you on the back and that that's right yeah that that reminder you no know, mom's always here yeah you know, mom never leaves you. mom's always in your heart mom always loves you mm -hmm. even though you left how many thousands of miles for 15 years and you know, before you came back to Malaysia, yeah. how long has it been? And you, you know, the 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 possibility you might not ever have a touch again, a physical touch again for your mom. Yes. But how you yes. found that, how you manifested for yourself, and it took eight moms <laughs> to, <laughs> to do that. But how beautiful that you had that. And one thing I love about those moms, I want to hear from you about them and how you met them. Yeah. But, um, that they're all crones. They're all what we consider crones. You know, they're they're older, wiser women. Yes. Yeah. Tell me how you met them. Uh, well, I was adopted at birth in Malaysia, uh, and that in itself is a very interesting and sort of unique experience in a way. And I learned more about it when my mom from Malaysia came and visited me for the first time after eight years. Uh, that I've been here and kind of told me the rest of the story, so to speak. But what was interesting was my parents, my adopted parents in Malaysia grew up during World War II. So uh, life was tough, obviously. My mom had three miscarriages. The first, after the first miscarriage, she adopted my sister, who is from a different family, by the way. She, uh, we're six years apart. And then she had the second miscarriage and then the third miscarriage was very tough because she was actually pregnant for about, uh, I think it was a late term miscarriage, like about seven, eight months or so. And it was a boy. <clears throat> and so that was really, really hard on her. And whole and behold, she adopted a boy. And the boy passed away a month later. So it was like really, really weird thing. And so 
I came from my father's side of the family, uh, my adopted father's side from a distant cousin. And I came from a family of 10 and I was the youngest one. Two of my older sister family was adopted out as well. And so, but apparently my maternal mom keep on telling my mom, don't worry if this is a boy, you know, I'll give it to you and so forth. So my mom was kind of paranoid about it. And this is a spiritual uh, show. And, and the reason why that's why I'm going a little bit at length about this. And I found out about it. My mom and my dad, my adopted mom and my adopted dad was kind of like, uh-huh. Yeah. You know, especially with all the scenarios with the miscarriage, right? Maybe it's not meant to have a boy. Well, they went to see a sage in Malaysia and the sage told her, don't worry. This boy is just resting in that woman's womb. It's meant for you. Told my dad, my dad, you know, we have how we have the lifeline where it goes straight down. My dad, my adopted dad has it on his right hand. Well, I have it on my left hand. The sage knew that and said, this boy, you know, you have that line. The boy has this line on his hand. And then told my parents, and don't forget that, because they just, uh, after World War II and all this, this boy, there will come a point in time, he will have to leave and go far away. And you have to let him go. The further he goes, the better off he is. And hold and behold, at 18, I had the opportunity to come to the United States. And my dad was sick and so forth, but my mom reminded him. Remember, everything this guy said has been coming to fruition. And if you take a look at the globe, Baton Rouge, Louisiana is on the other side of Malacca, Malaysia. If you drill a hole, is on that side. You might be off a little bit from a latitude standpoint. Right. You went you to know. LSU, right? Yeah. Isn't that funny? I mean, you know, it, it's just amazing. I tell people, like I say, even like you and I not now, because we've lived life, right? If someone were to show up, you know, and say, oh, Sandy, this is your life folder, okay? This is how you're going to live your life. Yeah, right. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but nice when we look back, sometimes. yes. <laughs> but when we look back, it's how that's how life unfolds, right. and yeah. so that's what happened with my Malaysian mom. I came to the United States. I met my uh, Southern Belle mom. She she was my host family, and beautiful lady. Uh, she is someone that you can't say no to. Very charming. Very never raised a voice, and so forth. I ran out of I ran out of excuses. She's the only one who made me eat my vegetables. So what can I say? <laughs> Couldn't get out of it. Uh, it was really wonderful. And interestingly That's enough sweet. now, I, you know, and, and I'll get into the kitchen thing, but, but it was very interesting. And then while I was flying, and this is what I was talking about, it's like things just unfold, right? Before I left Malaysia, I told my one of my teachers, and he actually, I'm not kidding you, he looked like the happy Buddha. Happy-go-lucky guy. And so I told him, I said, Mr. Ho, I have a chance to go to the United States to go to college. And Malaysia is being part of the British Commonwealth nation. A lot of people go to the UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand. So I was more like going to the United States or Canada. I'm going to the United States. And he was really happy. He says, I'm so happy and glad for you. But I want to tell you one thing, though, and I hope you don't get mad. When you get to the United States, don't go stay in Chinatown and all with all the Malaysians. Right? If you decide to stay in Chinatown and hang out with all the Malaysians, don't go. Everything you need to learn will eventually trickle down to Malaysia. Anything you need to learn. Okay. When you go, every culture has its good, bad, and ugly. Your goal is to combine the best of both and create a third culture. So, okay, that's interesting. Because of that, I end up getting my first year of college. I had to live on campus. So I end up getting an American roommate. But when I flew off from Kuala Lumpur to Hong Kong, my seatmate, she was a, a Hong Kong lady who is married to a British guy. So she's telling me about the world. From Hong Kong to Seoul, Korea, my seatmate was, uh, she's a song 
uh, a singer from New York. So she was telling me about the United States and where not to go in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have that information. <laughs> yeah, it was so interesting. And then here I'm in line in uh, Seoul, Korea at the airport. This tall guy in front of me is from Alabama. And he had a very heavy southern accent and he was trying to get his plane reroute, his ticket rerouted to, I believe, we're all flying to Hawaii and then to Los Angeles. I think he's trying to fly to San Francisco. And the lady could not understand him. So ask him, uh, you know, I, I don't understand you. And so he was getting a little frustrated. So he turned around looking at me, young man, do you speak Korean? He said, no, sir. <laughs> but I said, I understand what you're trying to get across. And maybe we Asian, you know, I can relate to her better, you know, by talking to her about it. So, okay, go ahead. No problem. And so I did, I got him ticket situated. So he was so happy. Now he asked me where I'm going. And I said, well, I'm going to Louisiana state university and all that. I have no idea about SCC football, <laughs> Crimson Tide, wow. you know, fighting tigers. Oh yes. Young man, you know, like, I mean, I have no idea. I want you to meet my buddy, my my uh, business partner. He's flying to LA and you, you all should uh, have dinner together. So, okay, sure. So that's how I met Ben, who is my Italian foster father. And so that summer, my first year here, I went up to visit him and his family in Papa Bluff, Missouri. That's how I met my Italian foster mom. Now, what's interesting about it, that's one thing. A year later when my father passed away, uh, but prior to that, because I came in the spring. So Ben, on his trip that year to Asia, had flown over to see my dad and my mom and my family and told them, rest assured, we'll take care of Johnny. We'll look after him. So don't worry about it and so forth. That was wonderfully assuring, so to speak. The year later when my dad passed away, he was in one of his trips, he had stopped by to visit my parents. Again, like I say, these are things that, wow, you can't plan that. No, you, know? you can say yes to every step of the way. And yeah. you were willing to have those conversations. You were willing to follow those threads. Yeah. That's yeah. largely and, and the odyssey. That's what we have an opportunity and a privilege to do. It's precisely beautiful how... These yeah. came into your life. Yeah, you know, and, and that's how it just sort of expanded itself. And right. then, of course, that's those how the first three moms in my life. And then when I started working and I traveled and so forth, I met my uh, Texan earthly mom that I used my uh, used her company to recruit management people. I met my uh, uh, progressive spiritual mom at one of the events and uh, and she just got connected and she's very, very, you know, uh, she calls me up on my birthday at 1201 to be the first one to wish me happy birthday. And then I met my sanguine Savannah mom in a business trip in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, and, and so it, it was just very, very interesting. And then in my leisure time, that's when I met my ballroom instructor mom, my Cajun mom and my German mom at different times uh, in my life, you know, as, as I go through. And the beauty of it, what's beautiful about it is that my mom, when she came over for the first time in eight years, was able to meet all the different ladies. And she was very thankful that uh -huh. that unity of moms, you know, like wanting their kids to do well. And I think that's the beauty of it. She was able to to meet all these wonderful women. And, and that's the beauty of it. But the one thing I do want to share, Sandy, is that yeah. you mentioned something about we have to be open. Right. You can receive if you don't want to receive. So I was always on, not that I'm in dire need of anything, but I'm very open. I This is one of the things that I talk about. It's very interesting. You always hear people use, get out of your comfort zone, right? That's a big thing. On the other hand, I teach, we never get out of our comfort zone. We expand it. Uh -huh. What's set power? Getting out of the comfort zone is like me. Remember that uh, the road runner, you know, like uh -huh. step out, the boulder hits it. Coyote, <laughs> wily <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, to me, uh -huh. that's getting out of the comfort zone. Expanding the comfort zone is okay. 
Stretching the edge. You know, hello world. Yes, curiosity. We didn't exactly land on the moon by just, uh, call me when you get there, all right? You know. uh, (laughs) And it's going to be hard. You'll feel that. (laughs) Right. They circle it about, you know, how many times before they land somebody. (laughs) But, Johnny, what you really embody is in your Mm -hmm. life and the collection of these women in your life that are so valuable to anybody, I imagine. Imagine, I I think of those as gems along our path that we step over. You are your soul is saying bring more women into my life and you say yes and they appear you made that happen but imagine all the opportunity and things that we're all possibly missing because we aren't maybe paying attention to opportunities oh Mm -hmm. here's somebody to listen to the next thing you know you're being introduced by way of maybe a series of other circumstances to this to this gem in your life, yes. right? It's a beautiful poem yeah. that goes, um, it's a line in a poem by, by Reverend Lisa Lee of Unity Church mm-hmm. actually in Las Vegas. She says, um, to ask where am I going or how do I get there is to miss the crimson red rose growing out of the rock of the sidewalk. In other words, you're, 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 if you just think you've got this plan, but you've got to keep open for possibilities and opportunities yes. and look at what's at your feet that's yes. needing a need in your heart. And, and I just love how these women came into your life. Can yeah. you tell me, can we, we've got to talk about the genius zone. <laughs> got to. I mean, come on, it's good stuff. And I, yeah. I know it's, it's important too, so. Yeah. No, it's, uh, what's interesting about it, these are the things, again, the, the, it's a process, right? We go through this. And when you look at it uh, in all actuality, this is the beauty of it. When you talk about, especially you're a mom, you understand this, quality or quantity. You know, the true answer is actually both because quality has agenda. Okay, hey, you, come on in. Let's have a, you know, lunch. What's up? What's What's going on? You know, we're talking, right? But quantity is just hanging out. But the beauty of quantity is this. It starts to build trust. It's in the moment it, that comfort, you become vulnerable, you're opening up because you can connect. True connections are actually made through quantity from a mother-child experience, if you think about it very carefully, not quality. Quality is like, mom, can I talk to you? Yeah, go ahead. I solved the problem. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, but it's that's really, you don't have that. I hope, yeah, can you realize sense. that what I'm just talking about? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really fascinating. the condition of abundance in what, what yes, you want. Yes, yes, right? yes. It's yes, really yes, being yeah. the condition of abundance with that, whether it's quantity or quality, it's the, it's, it's paying, it's really comes down to paying attention and listening. That's right. And listening, this is the beauty of it. Is it, it, it's, it during in between the, the silence in between words is where true connections are made. Uh, that's if the you think about space. It. This is, there yeah. is a, and I keep a, equating everything to some sort <laughs> of form because you are bringing in so much energy here. Yeah. Um, the Japanese ideogram ma, which is one of the symbols um, mm-hmm. that when I saw that symbol, I'm like, I wish I had that for a symbol over all of my chapters. Yeah. And I thought, wait, no, there's, and that's where <laughs> that whole idea came from. The, the ideogram of Ma is the symbol of a sun between two gates. And its meaning is the spaciousness of that moment. Mm-hmm. It's the mm-hmm. breath between the notes. It's the moment in between the steps of a tango. It's the rhythm of, um, you know, the poetry, right? It's that, it's that in between space. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. it's so that it's so important to the writings of the Torah, the Jewish Bible. I mean, it is we. It's so underrated and undervalued in our world, just in our Western yeah. society. So, say more about that space in between. Yeah, that's that space. If you look at it very carefully. True connections occurs 
we're in the silence in between words because it's the process it's the physicalness you know that's what it's all about it's a comfort from there that true connection comes trust and the funny thing about it is the quantity that feeds the quality totally not the other way around this brings me back to your you know the, you know mm -hmm. the rules or the conditions of really sacred listening and yeah. and that is pause yes right um and we as a society aren't comfortable with that uncomfortable silence mm -hmm. it's always got to be filled and i'm i'm yeah. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think it's not so much, you know, when we're pausing. I mean, there are a lot of things because we're distraction. We are distracted. I mean, you know, even in that book, I talk about uh, one of my moms always said, you know, look, if you just to stay silent for a moment, the answer's all around you. The question is, are you picking it up? So if you look from a technology standpoint of view, think about it. Do you know what's in the air right now? sound wave this wave that wave whatever well guess what just stick to sound wave whether it's the old radio or the new one if you think about it different frequency you turn 98 one uh you pick up this channel 98 five which is just a tad this way you got another channel now do we know about it no heck no it's out there our body is being bombarded by it <laughs> right but we don't we it's it's funny it's common sense but we don't think about it mm -hmm. so here is that beautiful dance between science and arts or whatever you want to call it the reality of it so if we take a moment and just say hey what are we tuning in and that's what we talk about that listening and talking your way to success where's your dial at yeah you see what are you dialing on and that is what you're going to get that's right what you set your dial what frequency there is yeah. actually a book called the trust frequency uh -huh. <laughs> <It's a good laughs> book. Um, but it actually um reminds us of that abundance mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. much in alignment with what you're talking about and your work yeah. all right yeah. so where all right well where can people go and find out about the genius code and it, would you like to spend some time? And well, the, that. the genius zone to me, it, and this is so interesting, though. I think I stumble onto the word genius zone. It's almost like, like you say, from my mama's kitchen. Whatever they're teaching me is actually they're in the zone of genius. When you think about it, okay, we don't think about it that way. But I tell you why. Let me give you an example. Does it take a mom to have a three PhD for that son to be a PhD or, you know, good in school? Yes. And also, no. I tell you what, this is how my mom works. She knows A, she knows B, she knows C, she knows D, as in David. Who cares about E? But she knows what the heck F looks like. And she couldn't care less of the rest of the alphabets. In her time and the culture and what, when you get old enough, it's Kitchen 101. But yet, as a mother, she knows what A, B, C, D stands for and what F sounds like, you know, looks for. She knows red means fail, blue, blue is pass. So believe me, you can't run past her and saying that, uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> uh <-huh>, really? <laughs> So my point is that is genius within itself. So coming back to the genius zone concept, that's what it's all about. Are we tapping into our innate ability that our, you know, our divine fingerprint that we're given when we were born? Are we harnessing that? And how do we get there? Is curiosity turns chaos into peace. And that's what it's all about. And then to go beyond that, that's where the clarity produces a creative mindset. The creative mindset ignites the courage to act with gentle confidence. Now, that's a big difference because you start to realize, oh, wow, yeah, I can act now. I feel good because it's a mindset, right? Because you have the courage now to act, okay? So 
now living in the moment allows you to celebrate the various successes when it occurs. The perpetual synergy of success, harmony, and joy. What does it do? It inspires you to continue to dream, achieve, and become. That's the difference, you see. So that doesn't mean, like I say again, everyone has that. And so with the Genius Zone, what I'm doing is uh, from my mama's kitchen uh, uh, dot org. It's an educational platform. Is where I'm teaching uh, workshops uh, to moms, uh, to teens, and tweens who are uh, the preteens. So that's called the Family Genius Zone. And the, I make it fun to whereby it's Mama's Genius Zone, Teen Genius Zone, and Twin Genius Zone. And within that, of course, we have some you know, things that we cover. But the whole overall concept is like, hey, we all have the ability. How do we tap into it? And then in addition to that, because of my corporate background, I'm also having a Corporate Family Genius Zone workshops as well to help corporations to come in and start looking at it from a different perspective. Because years ago, if you recall, oh, yeah, we're corporate family. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We celebrate, you know, every Friday, it's really we celebrate somebody's birthday. Yeah. Really. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. But it was funny. But is it the letter of the law or the spirit of the law? Because when you look at the spirit of the law, when you start looking from a different perspective that we hey, we're all family, we matter. The dynamics change versus just the oh, sure. letter it's of the measurable. Law. You have measurable yes. results for corporations. Yes. You want to yes. impress the company, you can prove that that's going to save their bottom line. Precisely, <laughs> precisely. And yeah. and the interesting thing about it, you know, these are the things that I did way back then. I didn't even realize it. And it's all coming into fruition, so to speak. You're coming clear now that, hey, you're speaking from an experiential standpoint of view. Uh, you know, it's not so it's both learn it as well as an experiential standpoint of view because I created that and applied that and that makes a big difference. So it's real. And when, for example, to give you an example, like uh, when we talk about the power of unconditional love, well, it starts, everything starts from home, right? The, the nuclear family. Home is where the first classroom everyone encounter. Home is where we first learn about love. Now, no doubt, there's all this exception to the rule. No question about it. But in the end, when you think about it, that's where it is. So personal success begins at home. The power of unconditional love, how do we use that to, to create all this? And this is what it's all about. And the success comes from within that, you know, we're able to do that. Because from the home, you affect the neighborhood, the community, the state or whatever you want to call it, county and, you know, expansion. Remember, we talk about expansion, self-expansion, everything. So that's the concept of this whole idea of the genius zone to whereby let's go back and take a look at how we can build. And we need it right now, actually. Oh, heavens, yes. <laughs> Our world is really, I really feel like we're not at a breakdown, we're at a break through of our society. Mm -hmm. We don't, like I said in the beginning, we don't know where we're going, but we know we're on our way. This is yeah. why uh, healing informed uh, or trauma informed healing is yes. a, a common, yes. you know, workshop you can find on any corner right now. And yeah. why folks are rushing to buy our books, yeah. you know, and why yeah. there's these seekers going, okay, there, it's time for something new and another way of reframing a new culture. And culture is nothing more than a collective agreement by all of yeah. us. And that starts yeah. in the home. It's yeah. practice in the home, you know, and it's how mm -hmm. we, um, manifest what's in our thoughts. Right. So it's like the chicken and the egg, you know, which comes from right, right. how we behave and our thoughts yeah. drive our behavior. Right. And then how we live that out in our home. And if we can't live within our home system, we're just hypocrites. <laughs> Excuse right. me, I don't right. mind just being very bold. It's right. not, it's not going to be sustainable. Anyway, Precisely. Especially if Precisely. you're part of a CEO of a right. corporation. Yeah. So where can everybody find you and <laughs> find out all your programs, how to find your magazine. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the the best place is to go to www.frommymamaskitchen. It's 
from F R O M and then my is M Y and then interesting is not M O M O S or whatever is Mamas basically Southern style M A M A S mm-hmm. Kitchen dot O R G and that's where you get everything from a standpoint because it is an educational uh, platform so I have everything there they can click on all the different tabs and also we have a magazine called Inspiration for Better Living. It's a digital magazine and is designed to help moms build a better future for themselves, their family, and loved ones. And this magazine is not about how to raise junior. There's so many other magazines that covers all that. This magazine got nothing to do with quote-unquote parenting, but it's talking about investing in you as the mother because you are the CEO, COO of your family. When mommy is happy, that ripple effect take care of itself. Mm-hmm. And you moms out there knows what I'm talking about. And so what we have is that this monthly magazine, we have wonderful, wonderful experts in their field that share their stories, their experience, so that you can navigate your life. And it doesn't matter where you're at. It's irrelevant because you can resonate with it. And believe me, nobody is up all the time. We're going to up, we're going to down, this, that, and so far, move sideways. And that's life. And that's what the difference is. And if I may leave something sort of uh, uh, inspiring, I guess I would say, I would, is this. I was going to ask you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Wisdom is about knowing others. Enlightenment is about knowing ourselves. Mm, wow, Big difference. Beautiful. Big difference. Once we embrace this philosophy of life, then what comes next? We are not the product of our environment, but rather our environment is the product of us. Beautiful. So that's the difference. Beautiful closing inspiration. And that's the change, the world we want to see. That's correct. Uh, that's, that's correct. Really and all of us can do this, Sandy. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I want to thank you for you taking the lead in your things that you have done. And it makes a big difference. And the more conversations we have about this, I think it will make an impact. Because like I say again, just because it's a small little, you know, stone that drops in the water, but that ripple effect goes a long way. And that's what this is all about. Absolutely. I want to thank you. Thank you for this gem of a book. Thank you for the gem that you are. Thank you for this culture that you are helping us co-create together for a world that works for everyone. Johnny, it was so, it was so lovely to have you, Johnny. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Johnny Tan, you're you're a gem. You really are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Blessings. Uh, Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. And you'll find all the information on Johnny and everything that was mentioned on this call right below this video. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye now.